Good morning. I'm sorry I don't know Dutch. I know uh, Fruitfrau, and uh, I know Drop, Drop. Uh. Because when I was a child, my best friend was a Dutch girl, so we love Drop, Drop. <laughs> uh, I hope English is okay. I have, uh, I want to talk to you so much like what the other, uh, I do research about the same, same about teaching and what, what uh, leads to attitudes. And I want today to uh, explore what has happened in Holland. When I was a baby midwife 30 years ago, I came to Holland, I worked with Astrid Lindbergh, and uh, she taught me what was physiological, what was normal birth. That was my. That was the beginning of what I was at Yale University. I wasn't learning about it there, and then later I had a wonderful mentor who did home and hospital births. She had been trained in England. She taught me what patience was, what being with women was, what trusting the process was. So, let's talk about what's happened and why here, not just in 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 the Netherlands, but all over the world, uh, uh, with the loss of normal birth. First, you have to understand what birth culture is. And it's, of course, the birth culture surrounds us as women and families. And we know now that we're no longer delivering close to home. Our, our, our grandmothers who delivered normally aren't near us. We're delivering more in the institutions. And the more we have intervention, the more that becomes the expectation and becomes normal. This is what we're told. If you get pregnant, you're going to be less attractive you'll look tired, it's really, it's, it's a problem when you get pregnant. And when you, when you go into labor finally, it'll happen unexpectedly, you'll break your water in the middle of a, uh, of a restaurant, it'll be embarrassing. Even if you are a strong young woman, you'll suddenly lose your strength and go screaming to the hospital. <laughs> suddenly it's an emergency, and of course you'll end up in bed your partner will be useless. <laughs> and, but don't worry, because a team of doctors and midwives will save you. If you don't want it to happen that way, you'll be told that you are selfish, that you don't care about the, the uh, health of your baby, that you're being an ineffective parent. <clears throat> and after the baby's born, you'd better quickly look like this. So if you think I'm just making that up, and if it's really, you know, that's the media, and that's not really what's influencing women, one of my colleagues, two of my colleagues actually at University of British Columbia studied this. They asked 40,000 university students, and they had an amazing response rate. Um, and this is, they had, it's a very worth, worth reading their article, but this is what they found, that if you had ever seen, if these young people who had never seen a birth had ever seen a birth that was a real live birth, they actually had a more positive attitude and a more, more uh, positive emotions around birth. Even if it was in the hospital, of course, even more positive if they had seen a home birth. But if their only exposure had been through birth or TV video, they were frightened. And then, of course, there is our our uh, impact, like what the first speaker said, is that we are now wondering, is it that women have changed? Do we need this because we have more technology? Or is it that, what about all this woman blaming? Are women too fat? Are they obese? Are they hooked on technology? Is it they're the ones that are too lazy? I had just last week, I had a midwife <coughs> here in Holland tell me that the women are lazy now. <coughs> and. Um, is it that they're too scared or they're too controlling, they want to control when they have the baby and that's why we can no longer, it's not, it's not about us? Well, I have something to tell you, that actually we know that in all fields that the power that we have as providers and whether it's we're physicians or midwives or nurses is, is really changing what people are, what w women, so if you <clears throat> have high blood pressure, this is in a different field, the most uh, strong predictor of what high blood pressure medicine you'll be given is the year that your doctor graduated from medical school. Yeah, in your the length and duration of breastfeeding is whether the length and duration of your provider's family member or themselves. If you choose elective C-section, more women who are obstetricians who have elective C-sections themselves 
their significantly more of their patients choose that. So it's, it's all over. We know this. There's lots. And I, as I go through this, I can't go through the literature. You'll see there are citations. But all of it is research-based now. So what shapes provider attitudes? This is what I study. Is it science or exposure or education or peer pressure? Well, I studied this in the US and in Canada. And I studied it with, with certified nurse midwives who mostly do just hospital births very well-trained professionals like yourselves. And I studied it with family physicians and obstetricians and registered midwives who, like yourselves, are direct entry. And what we found in both places that if you were exposed, if you had seen one birth even as an observer, you were more favorable than someone who hadn't. And the more exposure you had, the more favorable you got. And definitely if it was in your education. And all these other factors that affect our attitudes, they were, they were there too, but not as powerful. But if they were there, they were all about in unfavorable attitudes. Why is that? This is, this is a, a woman who's in the hospital where I practice uh, now. I've been practiced for 30 years. This is in British Columbia. This is what we see. This is a normal birth by Canadian standards. She's in her bed. And she can see she's got her earphones on. She had, this woman had to retreat into her space so she could just ignore everything that was happening. All the bells and whistles and tapes and things. This is what our image of birth, even for us. And of course, this also is in my hospital. And this was considered a successful birth. So what about those perceptions of risk? Is it the women that are too scared? This is a one in a thousand risk. That's what we're talking about, the differences. One in a thousand, when we're talking about planned home birth, we're talking about uh, you know, induction. And many of the things are in that. That's a, in most, most of life, your risk of lifetime dying is one in 83 in a car accident. We don't even think about that. We get in cars all the time, right? <clears throat> so what's happening here? This is a picture that, that actually I just got last week uh, from a, Italian, a wonderful Italian uh, obstetrician, Serena Donati, who said that the, in Italy they were asked, uh, they asked children to say, <clears throat> what is it, uh, what, draw a picture of, of birth. They just said, draw a picture. And this is the pictures, these are the pictures that they got back. That is the image of birth that our children have now. So why has that become our norm? Because obstetric technology as, is the assurance of a favorable outcome. The, you've got you know, the, the monitors, you've got, uh, the woman is of course completely alone. She's got a, a male there to help her. And uh, maybe that's her partner, I don't know, but he's not close by. Oh yeah, he's lying down, exactly. There you go. So why have women, and why have we become disem disempowered? What, is, what has happened? Once we become disempowered, we no longer involved in leading obstetric care the way our first speaker told us that you know and when i was trained you know the midwives taught the doctors <clears throat> and that then becomes the normal that is normalization right that becomes everybody's expectation and then people are worried about being sued if they don't do what's now normal and then we lose our skills we lose our own confidence and it's a vicious cycle so t tell me, is undisturbed birth unsafe? And who defines safety? Is it the woman or is it us? Who's most invested and who's most responsible? So let's see what women say. These are all based on research also. Sorry. So this is what women say is most important to them that makes them feel safe. Privacy, freedom to move, that they can choose themselves, that their culture is respected, that they feel respected, that their family is involved. When that doesn't happen, this is the impact on women. They feel they have a loss of culture, a loss of a familiar environment, a loss of family support, loss of privacy and dignity, loss of autonomy and respect, a loss of confidence, a reduction in self-care and efficacy, and of course we know about depression. This, there are all the citations. It's not, we're not talking about one study, right? It's been shown again and again. What do women say? 
There was this very large systematic review, many, many, again, 137 studies. It says women say that what they expect out of birth and the amount of support they got from their care, caregivers and how much that relationship, how did they know their midwife, the quality of that, and the, how involved they were allowed to be in decision making, it, that's what drives their experience and their, their feeling of whether or not they were happy about what happened. So we did this uh, study in just uh, last year in uh, British Columbia. It was a community-based participatory action of study where I didn't, I helped the women do it, but the women did it themselves. We did a community consultation of 1,300 women. We got a steering group. We had all these community partners. We had uh, midwifery clients, potential midwifery clients. We had street women who lived on the street, women who were formerly incarcerated, refugee and immigrant women, very diverse. And they were, they said, this is what we want to study. We want to study access to care. I mean, British Columbia is a huge, huge province. We don't have enough prov providers. We want, we want you to tell the story about what we care about and model. And we want to understand this issue of the impact of birthplace. But most important, we want you to tell the story about decision making. So they created the survey. You can see we got 4,000 responses. We had 1,300 responses in 24 hours after launching the survey, and it was an hour and a half long survey. Women are dying to tell their stories. It was a long survey. We got lots and lots of information. I can't tell you all of it today, but I'm going to tell you a couple of things. What they said was, this is what, when we asked them, we gave them a list of 25 different things about, and they could say what was very important, what was least important as far as model of care, how many people they met, you know, who was there, and we told them things that you, you know, do you prefer that, is it make you more comfortable if your provider leads the decision or you lead the decision? These are the things that came up that were most important to them. The most important thing you can see here, 89.8% uh, was having a trusting relationship with my care provider. They want to lead the decisions. We, 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 we asked it three different ways, and in fact, there were very, very few people who said they were more, it was more important for their midwife or doctor to lead the decision than themselves. Even, even those who wanted the information from the midwives or doctors said they wanted to lead it, and then they wanted to be guided. And the other thing that was so, so important, they wanted enough time to ask questions and discuss options. How much time do you have for your prenatal visits these days? We did a mixed effects analysis because we, people could tell us about many different uh, um, births. And this is what we found. To understand this, you look at the, 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 the broader stripes mean it's most, more significant. And if they're orange, it means that they, the scores on, so the madam scale is a scale that we made out of this study, which, which measures how much autonomy a woman has when in decision making. So does she feel like she could lead the decision? So what we found was if there are differences is the reference category was women who planned hospital births with midwives. So we've got women who planned home births with midwives in the middle there were, uh, it's blue, so that meant that they felt they had a little bit more autonomy, but it's not very much more. If you uh, saw a, a family physician, obstetrician, uh, or if you felt like your provider was, and midwives or doctors was too rushed, you would hold back your questions. If you felt that you had a difference of opinion from your provider, they held back their question, questions. And if they felt that the provider would think they were being difficult, they held back their questions. And if they held back their questions for any of those reasons, they felt like they lost their autonomy. Same. If they felt pressured to have a C-section, whether or not they had a C-section, if they had a section but they weren't pressured, they didn't feel like they lost their autonomy. But if they felt pressure to have a section, pressure to have an induction, they lost their autonomy. So what if they instead knew what uh, knew this? What if, what if we had enough time to let women know that undisturbed birth actually is evidence-based to improve their physical and mental health? What if they knew that all of these things that we do that to promote comfort and progress, they work. 
as well as those other things. That these these are all have been studied. The ones in yellow have shown been shown to have significant improvements. What if they knew about the effects of oxytocin and noradrenaline? You've all heard about oxytocin, all the research around it, and how it, it helps us helps us and helps our babies come out like that, undisturbed babies. What if they really? What if women had enough time? to understand from us and from their discussions that there are things that disturb physiological birth. All the things that we know, and again, you can see the citations. Any situation in which the mother feels threatened or unsupported, time constraints, separation, not letting them eat and drink. What if they knew the truth about cesarean? Do you really have less pain? Are you really safer? Are your babies safer? What if they knew about the microbiome? This is, this is what they find. These three bacteria are what happens, what, what the baby picks up if they come down through the vagina. This is what babies are, are uh, colonized with if they are um, born by C-section. Completely different bacteria. And they know now that that connect, connects to their future health and asthma and diabetes and obesity. So that's, that's emerging research about epi, epidemi, epigenetics. It's not, but it's, it, it's curious, isn't it, how different we're doing? What if they knew that there's actually no evidence to support ECG, ruptured membranes, routine hospitalization? Is there any evidence about VBAC and hospital? Do, have we ever done that study? What about screening? What about ultrasound? Women think that it's normative. They think you're not doing something right. If you're, but what if they knew the truth? What if we had the time to tell them the truth? And you know this story, of course. Who interprets the evidence? And who's telling them the truth about safety? Would they then believe that this is what birth looks like? Or maybe this? Would that be the image? So what I want to say is that we are the experts, right? We have so many research now. It's, even this week, uh, Jane Sandals Cochrane on midwife-led care. We have lots and lots of support. The Lancet series. We are the experts. We've been doing this. We know about physiologic birth. We can teach the students. We know about optimal outcomes and when technology needs to be used and about using resources. What's our role and our responsibility? How can we use clients and the media to change the story? And this is what I want to leave with you, Elizabeth, is that we should really work together with the women. They're doing it. They, you know, we can do this campaign for normal birth. We can change the story. They're already doing it. You can have positive images. The women who are doing free birth, they've figured it out. They're telling the story. And we're being left in the dust, so I think we need to join them. We need to ask the question, why was she put in the monitor instead of why wasn't she put on the monitor? And the last question I have for you is, you have this list, what is it called? The feel, feel. So we all, there's, I know there's a big debate here. You know, do we want the list, do we not want the list? What the obstetricians want to do the list? Well, why aren't you controlling the list? It's your list, it's your practice, right? I'm sorry. I'm, of course, I was brought up in the US and I live in Canada, and that's a pro uh, probably a North American attitude. But I, you know, we revere the, in North America, we're always looking, oh, the Dutch midwives. I mean, you have the opportunity to change really the world's way of looking for it if you take that control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.